Good evening, good day, good morning, wherever you're joining us from uh, uh, around the world. And I hope I can still wish you all a happy new year because this is our first international organization medical physics of medical physics webinar for the year 2024. And I will share my screen now. Okay. Hopefully you can see my screen. And it is my biggest pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Douglas to give today's talk that's titled From Pixels to Patients, The Influence of Gaming and Smartphone Development on Radiation Oncology. Uh, Dr. Douglas is a principal medical physicist at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, where he oversees treatment planning system and planning support services. And he also works part-time at the Australian Berg Center for Proton Therapy and Research, where he contributes to proton therapy comparative planning and research. He's also an adjunct at the University of Adelaide, supervising PhDs and master's students in medical physics. His expertise includes proton therapy, Monte Carlo simulation, machine learning, 3D printing, as reflected by his numerous publications. His contributions to the field have earned him multiple awards, with the recent ones being the Simpson Prize for Cancer Research and ACPSCM, which is our Australasian uh, College of Physical and Physical Scientists and Engineers in Medicine, Boyce Worthley Young Achiever Award. So it is my great displeasure to have Michael with us today. I'll stop sharing. Michael, over to you. And we are very much looking forward to your presentation. Can I please just remind the participants to post your question into the Q&A tab of your uh, Zoom screen, and I will run the question and answers uh, after Michael's presentation. Over to you, Michael. Thank you very much for that nice introduction, Eva. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? Great. Uh, well, thank you very much for joining this presentation today. I think it'll be a little bit different, so I, I hope you enjoy it. Um, so I'm just going to be talking about an interest of mine, which is looking uh, for ways to incorporate consumer technologies into radiation oncology for the benefit of patients. So uh, the major industries I want to talk about and how they influence radiation oncology are mainly the video game industry, movie and film, and smartphone developments. And then I'm going to give some examples of how these different technologies have improved our radiation oncology workflow and how they will improve it in the future. So the first question you probably have is, how do video games possibly relate to radiation oncology? So I just want to give you a brief historical overview of the development of video games, and hopefully that'll make it clearer how it fits into this. So early video games started in the early 1970s with the birth of arcade video games like Pong and Space Invaders, which you might be familiar with. By the 1980s, we started seeing uh, home video game consoles like the Nintendo Entertainment System and Sega Genesis. And in the 1990s, we saw the first 3D uh, video game consoles like the PlayStation and Nintendo 64. And these consoles required more powerful uh, graphics processing because of the nature of the way they render the video games. The term GPU or graphical processing unit was popularized by the company NVIDIA who make video, uh, video cards nowadays um, in 1999. And they uh, essentially produced the first consumer level dedicated graphics cards. By the turn of the millennium, we saw games like Half-Life 2 and Crisis pushing the boundaries of graphics qualities. And these sorts of games demanded more powerful GPUs from um, GPU manufacturers. By the 2010s, we saw the GPU becoming a very powerful and general purpose computing tool um, with the development of things like NVIDIA CUDA, which allow you to create parallel versions of your code and utilize the GPU cores, of which there are many on most GPU cards. GPU manufacturers like NVIDIA and AMD started optimizing their GPUs for AI and deep learning um, applications, and this led to significant advances in this field. 
By the 2020s, the GPU has become the, at the heart of AI and machine learning. And we also see the development of specialized GPU architectures for machine learning, like the NVIDIA Tensor Core and Google Tensor Processing Unit, which are very specialized versions of GPU specifically for training machine learning models. And today we find that GPUs are integral in pretty much every aspect of our lives, not just in gaming, but in uh, applications like autonomous vehicles and medical research, which we're all used to. So the development of GPU has been driven by the demand for high quality graphics in games. And this has led to the development of very high specification and very general purpose GPUs for other applications like science and medicine. So the application we're probably most familiar with uh, in terms of GPU is deep learning segmentation in radiation oncology. We're also seeing the benefits of GPUs for accelerated dose calculations in our treatment planning systems. And while it may not be immediately apparent, I think large language models are becoming um, more important in our, in our clinical workflows. As well as GPU technology, the video game industry has given us virtual reality technologies, which I think will lead to more intuitive methods of visualizing medical data. So we're gonna see advancements in medical image visualization, and I think it's also important for various clinical techniques, um, for example, deep inspiration breath hold and helping to guide the patient to reach the optimal um, inhalation um, limit. And I think it's also very important for future education, both for staff and for patients. So I just wanna quickly talk about deep learning segmentation because I think that's probably the application we're most familiar with, which requires powerful GPUs. So deep learning segmentation models are an automated method of contouring organs at risk and sometimes even targets in our treatment planning systems. And they use convolutional neural networks to automatically segment these organs at risk. More recently, we've seen uh, general purpose segmentation models like Meta's Segment Anything uh, model, which is an open source um, code, which was made public by Meta. And it's essentially contours pretty much any image data, including medical, in a way that would be more uh, in line with how a human would interpret and segment data. So it looks for discrete borders of different regions. And uh, you can look more into this, but I think it's going to be um, a direction that we head in radiation oncology. So you don't have to train machine learning models specifically for cranial sites or abdominal. You, you will just have perhaps one general purpose model, which will be able to segment various regions of the body. So I think deep learning segmentation has had huge impacts in radiation oncology, mainly because it leads to more consistent and accurate contours for patient plans in much less time, saving radiation oncologists huge amounts of time. The other major area where we're seeing benefits from GPU technology are dose calculations in treatment planning systems. So the major vendors uh, like um, Electa, Varian and Ray Research Laboratories are now all using some form of GPU acceleration in their dose calculation engines um, for uh, both uh, Monte Carlo, Photon, Proton and Electron Monte Carlo. And I think the impact of this again is huge uh, clinically. Um, it allows us to generate very uh, highly optimized treatment plans and the final dose calculation is usually a very accurate Monte Carlo dose calculation, which can be calculated in seconds to minutes, depending on the hardware. And if you compare this to what it was five or 10 years ago, Monte Carlo was really just a research tool. And to get a reasonable number of statistics, you'd have to run the simulations for hours to days um, to collect reasonable levels of data. And I think ultimately this is gonna lead to better quality plans and hopefully better clinical outcomes for our patients, but I think we need to see more evidence on this. And you've probably heard a lot about large language models in the news and just um, uh, large language models like Meta's Llama model, OpenAI's ChatGTP, Google's Bard or Gemini. And the one I wanna talk about in particular today, which you may not have heard of is GitHub Copilot which is a variation of GPT that was trained almost exclusively on programming and scripting data. I think the most immediate impact, at least from my perspective, from these large language models is perhaps uh, accelerating and um, reducing the time that it takes us to write scripts for treatment planning systems and optimizing workflows to save time, and also developing code for clinical and research um, projects. 
I think given the amount of patient medical data we have in our oncology information systems, for example, in various forms, PDFs, handwritten notes, I think large language models are going to go a long way to helping us summarise that data and perhaps make better clinical decisions. And something else I've been experimenting with recently is using large language mo models for education purposes. So training or uh, generating custom GPTs with medical physics and radiation oncology specific uh, information like AAPM reports or IEA reports. And then you can then ask the GPT to uh, answer questions for you. And I, I think this will be a very valuable education tool in the future. So going back to the GitHub Copilot example, as I mentioned, this is a version of GPT trained exclusively on uh, programming or coding um, information. So I use this commonly for helping to write race station treatment planning scripts. Um, so here's an example, quite a simple one, but it will get the point across. So I asked GitHub Copilot to write me a race station Python script, which prompts the user for a GUI, uh, using a GUI for a structure selection from the available list of structures in the plan. And then it also asks for an expansion margin in units of millimeters. The script should then take the selected structure and perform a uniform expansion of the structure by the specified amount and then save this new structure with the original structure name plus and appended underscore expand. So this is a, a task you probably wouldn't normally write a script for. It's just a simple operation, but it's a very basic task just to illustrate how GPT or uh, GitHub Copilot would handle this. So I asked it to do this for me and it wrote me some code. And at first glance, it looks pretty good. It has the structure of a race station script. Um, no obvious issues with it. So I put it straight into race station to see if it worked. And probably not surprisingly, there was an error. I'd be shocked if there wasn't. Um, but if you look, it's giving the error here. It says object has no member structures. So I looked at the line where it was pointing to the error and it was just this one here. And it was pointing to a data array um, that didn't exist, but it was actually pretty close to what it should have been. All it needed was this ROI geometries. So I fixed it up, that just that one change and rerun the code. And amazingly, it generated me this GUI. Um, I could use this pull down menu, select the structure from the list that had of contours that had been contoured already. I typed an expansion margin, pressed expand structure and the code worked as expected. So it just required a single minor change. And I think the code probably needed a bit more optimization to make it more user-friendly, but it performs the function and it probably saved me an hour, if not more of time writing this code from scratch. And I think this is a very valuable tool and it's really gonna help us optimize our workflows. And while it's generally not good at writing you very complex long scripts, if you break it down into smaller steps with smaller subfunctions and sort of guide it towards what you're working for, um, it, it's a very useful tool. Uh, on the, the point of large language models, so there was this interesting paper published just last year where they looked at the use of um, ChatGTP as a self-diagnostic tool for uh, diagnosing orthopedic diseases. And I won't go into the details of, uh, of this paper, but it's an interesting read and I think it highlights how these models are going to uh, translate into radiation oncology and hopefully help us there. The other area that the gaming industry has um, uh, developed into is virtual reality. And I think we're gonna start seeing these technologies adopted for radiation oncology. So the, the first major area I think where this is gonna benefit our uh, disciplines is education. Uh, firstly, patient experience. I, I think there have been some publications over the last few years that have shown that when you provide additional uh, technical information uh, about a patient's treatment to them, they're, they're perceived outcome or their actual outcome of their treatment or I guess satisfaction of their treatment is improved. Um, this isn't for every patient, but there are certainly a cohort of patients who would like to know more about the technical aspects of their treatment. And this is one example here from a paper in 2023 where they uh, generated these virtual reality experiences for patients so that they could experience what the, um, uh, the simulation step would look like, what it would be like to wear the mask for head and neck and brain patients. Uh, what it would look like on the first day of treatment in the LINAC bunker, and then give them a bit of a tour of the LINAC um, bunkers themselves. Um, and the other example here was a paper from 2022 where they generated, generated these personalized virtual reality experiences for patients based on their real patient data 
So you can see here the outline of the external contour, the organs at risk and the target, and being able to simulate the MLC leaves and really giving them a good idea of what their treatment would be like, I think goes a long way to help alleviate that stress and anxiety that the patient may feel. The other example I think is staff education. So these are just some examples I made with the um, MetaQuest 3 virtual reality headset. I just imported some models of a linear accelerator, um, the rando anthropomorphic phantom and an anatomical uh, a model of a heart with annotations. And I think these are just very simple examples of um, how this could help education for staff who may not have access to certain kinds of equipment and want to learn more about it and interact with it. Um, and there are already various virtual reality platforms out there which already do this. I want to talk about the movie Avatar, which might seem like a bit of a deviation from what we're talking about. But uh, for those who have seen this movie, I think you'll agree it's a remarkable feat of uh, visual effects. And um, this movie was the result of a lot of technological advancements in the field of visual effects. For example, um, they introduced real-time rendering during the filming process. So the actors and actresses in this movie wore, uh, wore motion capture suits, which allowed them to track the position and overlay real-time renderings of their actual character from the movie. And this gave the director more creative freedom to sort of see what the movie was going to be like um, and not just see the actors in these motion capture suits. They also introduced very sophisticated motion tracking so they could track the expressions of the actors' faces and their mouths and eyes and translate this to their actual avatars in the movie. Why I think this is important is I think the movie industry has led to huge advancements in the field of visual effects, which might immediately not uh, seem obvious how it would translate to medical physics or radiation oncology, but I think it's important in the main respect would be generating synthetic training data for training machine learning models, which would then benefit um, our workflows. Also data visualization methods, as I mentioned, the real-time rendering engines that they developed in this are now general, uh, generally available. Um, and I think this will allow us to visualize medical data in more intuitive ways. Also, these big blockbuster movies um, required sophisticated 3D modeling software to um, make assets and um, visual effects for the movies. And because of these, this long history of um, 3D modeling in movies, these packages are now generally available to the public for other applications. Uh, so the, the major software packages that you might have heard of are um, Blender, which is an open source 3D modeling package. There's also the commercial alternative, which is um, the Autodesk Maya and 3DS Max, which are used in the film industry. And I think these packages in particular lead to advancements in our field, for example, generating more complex Monte Carlo simulation geometries. So in the early days of Monte Carlo, you could really just use simple structures like cubes and spheres and then do subtractions between them. But having these general purpose 3D modeling packages allow us to make very sophisticated geome geometries and improve the accuracy of Monte Carlo simulations for research in particular. There's also the ability to manipulate um, patient contours and structures from planning systems to make uh, bolus and brachytherapy surface applicators. And then you can 3D print these um, for clinical use. So making customized medical devices for patients. And I think also the motion capture technology from films will have a big um, effect on radiation oncology treatments, mainly for real-time patient tracking. So the first example I gave was training, uh, synthetic training data generation using visual effects. So I just wanted to give some examples of how this has already been applied to various aspects of science. This is a paper from 2017 um, where they used synthetic data generation for automotive applications. So this could be for training machine learning models for autonomous vehicles and detecting pedestrians, for example. So here's an example of a photograph taken of an intersection with cars, the road, traffic lights, for example. And you could go around and you could take large number of photos and videos of these sorts of scenes to train it. But you could also just generate these synthetic scenes using 3D modeling packages. And this gives you a lot more flexibility to change the colors of cars or the directions or different shapes of cars and trees, for example. So you can generate huge amounts of um, training data automatically and very rapidly using this technique. 
Uh, from the medical field, uh, there's this paper from 2018 where they generated these synthetic glioblastomas um, in patient CT data, and they were able to randomize the position and size and shape, and you could generate very, very accurate segmentation masks for this training data, which you could then feed into or maybe fine-tune a deep learning model to give more robust uh, predictions of the segmentations of tumors, not just organs at risk. And there was also this interesting paper um, from 2020 where they wanted to try and um, segment uh, nanoparticles on microscopy images. And there are various techniques you can use to do this automatically. But the advantage of using this method is um, they simulated the position of, and randomized the shape and size of these nanoparticles. And using the 3D modeling software, they were able to generate perfect segmentation masks for each of the nanoparticles. And then if you render these from the perspective of a, a microscopy image, I guess, um, you can train the machine learning model and then it will generalize to real microscopy images so you can get very, very accurate masks um, to quantify the nanoparticles in research. I think synthetic training data is also very useful for radiation oncology. Uh, this is a project I did with a student back in 2019 where we used randomized uh, 3D um, procedural noise to generate these synthetic CT data sets, this randomized CT data where we assign different densities to different regions. We were then able to simulate these Monte Carlo uh, photon beams on these geometries with lots of different field sizes, different CT geometries. And then we could train a machine learning model to convert the fluence uh, of these beams with the CT data so that the machine learning model could learn the, the behavior to calculate the dose. And we found this generalized really well to patient data as well. In 2021, we also looked at applications of synthetic data for training machine learning models for performing machine QA on our linear accelerators using EPID data. So we modeled a very simple model of a linear accelerator head. We have the MLCs here. We have a radiation field. We simulated our um, QA phantom, which is just a perspex block with some ball bearings for scaling and Winston Lutz isocenter measurements. And we also simulated the response of the EPID to this. And this is what it sort of looks like from the beam's eye view. Um, you can see the phantom here, the central ball bearing and the radiation field defined by the MLC leaves here. And this allowed us to generate these uh, randomized EPID images or simulated EPID images. And since it was all done in Python, and um, this was done in Blender as well. We could just randomize the collimator angles, the MLC positions, the light intensity, the, the apparent contrast of the ball bearing, so we could generate tens and tens of thousands of these images without doing any measurements. And the benefit of this was, uh, since it was all done in Python, we knew exactly where the mask was for the radiation field, the ball bearing in each image, and the radiation field. And then we found without any additional training on real data, it generalized very well to real EPID images. These are some examples here, uh, some extreme examples where the ball bearing was quite a long way from the isocenter. The blue field here or light contour here is the prediction of the deep learning model for the edge of the MLC radiation field. Uh, it looks a lot bigger than this because of the windowing, but I chose the windowing to highlight the segmentation of the ball bearing, which the deep learning model predicted here. And you can see with sort of traditional edge detection methods, um, it sort of struggles when it gets close to the um, edge of the MLC field, whereas the deep learning model, which uses more of, I guess, a knowledge-based uh, approach, it, it, it learns the representation of these structures, does a much better job and is more robust. And the other area um, of the film industry, which I think has led to benefits in radiation oncology is um, uh, this development called OpenVDB from DreamWorks Animation. Uh, sorry, just play that again. Uh, so OpenVDB was developed by DreamWorks Animation for feature films. It's a way of storing sparse volumetric data. So water simulations, fire, smoke, those sorts of things. Uh, there might be some examples in here you recognize. Uh, there's a, yeah, here's one from Frozen. Uh, so it's called OpenVDB, it was developed by DreamWorks, and it's just a very efficient storage method and way of manipulating sparse volumetric data. And it might not seem obvious why this uh, relates to radiation oncology, but we actually have a lot of volumetric data in medicine in the form of DICOM data. We have CT, MRI, dose volumes, for example. And I think I saw this development as an opportunity to try and 
visualize this medical data in a more intuitive um, and informative way. So we developed this um, open source package called MedBlend, which is based on the open source modeling package uh, Blender, which you can download for free as well. And this uses um, or performs 3D volumetric visualization of medical data using the open VDB package. And I'll just play these animations here. Uh, I think this gives you a more intuitive method of visualizing this data. So this is a CT scan of the rando anthropomorphic phantom uh, windowed to the bone level. You can see you get these really nice renders. Here's a saber prostate treatment. You can see the CT, the structures, and the dose region. At the moment, it's showing the high dose region, but you can window it to the low dose region. And I think it gives you a very good, a clear picture of what's going on in the treatment. Similarly, here's another CT of the lower extremities of a patient. And this is a uh, proton pencil beam scanning treatment using real DICOM plan data, CT data, and dose. You can see the pencil beam painting the layers, energy layers there. The red spots indicate highly weighted proton spots and blue lower weighted spots. And you can see how it builds up this 3D dose distribution. Uh, MedBlend's not limited to just 3D volumes like this MRI. It can also simulate 4D CT scans like this 4D CT lung volume here. Where you can see the lung volumes meet, uh, moving through the different phases. And here's just some other examples. So you can see how you can adjust the windowing. And you can see the bone region of the rando phantom, the pelvic slices, or you can see the skin volume when it restarts. And here's another saber prostate treatment showing the contours highlighted in green, the CT volumes and the dose region. You can also do MLC animations. This is a real VMAT treatment um, showing the animation of the MLC leaves throughout the treatment from the beam's eye view. And finally, this is just an example that we did for the Karolinska University Hospital in Sweden. Uh, we developed this animation for them, which shows the delivery of two pencil beam proton uh, spot scanning techniques. You can see two fields, you can see the spots and the energy layers being built up and the overall dose distribution appearing here. So MedBlend is powered by OpenVDB, which is a development of the film industry. It's an open source package which uses Blender and I think it gives a more intuitive and informative way to visualize medical data. And I think we're gonna see technologies like this adopted in treatment planning systems to help visualize the data and plan data in a better way. If you're interested in downloading this software, here's a QR code that you can scan if you want to download it, um, but there'll be a link to it afterwards. So I think the film and movie industry have given us new medical visualization options for the treatment planning system and potentially visualizing treatments in real time. Uh, the most valuable aspect I think is for generation of synthetic training data. And this gets around the issues of applying for ethics applications to access real clinical data or scenarios where you just don't have any data available or not a large amount of it. And also uh, development of CAD software and 3D modeling software, which have been largely driven by the movie industry, which will have uh, huge impacts or is starting to have impacts on the 3D printing for medical devices, which I'll talk about uh, more about in a minute. And that now moves me on to smartphones. So as you're probably aware, smartphones are incredibly advanced devices now, full of lots of different sensors like thermometers, barometers, compass, gyroscopes, multiple cameras, clocks, ambient light sensors, magnetometers, fingerprint scanners, and microphones. But in recent years, and largely driven by development of the metaverse, um, we're seeing the introduction of, um, for example, facial ID scanners, which scan the geometry of your face and compare it to a baseline. And if the uh, the measurement and the baseline match, then it generally accepts that it's you that's trying to unlock the phone and lets you in. Uh, and this uses a structured light scanning technique where it projects a grid of light onto your face. And then the camera measures the distortion of this grid because your face isn't a flat surface and can estimate what the shape of your face is. Photogrammetry has been around for a long time. Um, this is the art of taking photographs of an object from lots of different directions and then reconstructing a 3D model from that photo. And it's been around in one form or another for quite a while, but um, with the development of GPU technology, it's become uh, readily accessible to many people in uh, mainly film industry, but it's used um, by for research now as well, maybe like uh, archaeology uh, applications, for example. Um, but this has become 
easier to access now with the um, development of 3D scanning technologies in smartphones. And also modern smartphones are now including devices like uh, small factor LiDAR scanners, like this on an iPhone here, uh, which is a very powerful device for 3D scanning objects in a very short amount of time. So the main uh, techniques for 3D scanning of objects is uh, LiDAR, which was previously used for applications in science and um, uh, I guess topology of the, the planet and measuring the depth of oceans and things by having fl planes fly over the ocean, sending out a laser pulse, and then measuring the time it takes to come back to the plane. And that gives you some indication of the distance to the object. Uh, but this has now been miniaturized into smartphones and you can now uh, scan 3D objects of your environment in, and use it in various applications. Photogrammetry, as I mentioned, taking photos of an object from lots of different directions and then uh, reconstructing that back into a 3D model. And structured light scanning is very popular as well. So it is used as a facial recognition scanner in phones, uh, but it's also used for various other applications, including surface guided radiation therapy. So I see some big advantages and um, gains to be made using 3D scanning technologies in radiation therapy. We've already seen quite a few publications on the use of 3D scanning technology for making customized medical devices and bolus for patients in radiation therapy. I see um, this technology maturing to the point where we can use it for radiation-free patient simulation for various treatment modalities. And we're already seeing it um, used for surface guided radiation therapy for patient position verification during treatments. I just want to um, highlight this paper that was done by a student of mine, Corey Bridger. So he was investigating the use of photogrammetry to generate surface mold brachytherapy applicators for radiation therapy applications. Uh, this is from one of his papers where this sort of highlights the method of photogrammetry where you take photos of, in this case, the rando anthropomorphic phantom from lots of different directions and angles, and you can reconstruct it into a high quality 3D model. Uh, once you have that 3D model, you can then choose the area of the body that you want to treat on the patient, or in this case, the phantom. And we chose the bridge of nose as a very complicated treatment site. And then you can generate these very nice applicators and you can extrude the catheter, excuse me, uh, the catheter channels through the applicator. And then you can put your ID, uh, iridium source uh, through the applicator and then treat the patient. So in this study, he was doing a comparison between CT derived 3D printed applicators, which is the standard approach of just generating the external contour of the body from the CT scan, and then um, generating these applicators that fit on the surface. Uh, whereas Corey was investigating the use of photogrammetry to uh, instead generate these, these applicators, which don't require any radiation to, um, on the part of the, uh, imaging the patient. This was the sort of proposed workflow. So you take a 3D model of the patient, you outline the area that you want to treat. In this case, we wanted the bridge of nose, but we also wanted to include enough of the face that it would conform very well to the nose region. You then extrude out um, a certain thickness, and that will depend on the depth you want to treat in the patient in brachytherapy. And then you can generate these uh, catheter tunnels, um, which you can then 3D print for the patient. And in the study, we were able to show that the CT-based and the photogrammetry-based applicators uh, achieve pretty much the same dosimetric quality in the brachytherapy plans. This is just an example of a, it's an animation of the different applicators using both photogrammetry and CT, and you can roughly see that they're quite similar. I wanna highlight some of the work uh, of Scott Crow and their group from uh, Queensland University of Technology. Um, they were using these handheld structured light scanners to scan patients. And uh, you can see the resolution of these scans is incredibly detailed. And they were able to generate these very conformal um, boluses for patients. And I think this is very promising work. In 2023, I published an editorial where I was talking about the various scanning modalities available for radiation oncology. Where the standard approach was to use CT to define the contour of the patient body. But we also explored the use of LIDAR scanning um, to scan these phantoms. So you can see similar quality, but then we came to the conclusion that photogrammetry and structured light scanning really is the new standard um, for generating these bolus due to the resolution you can get. You can really see like the numbering of the slices here on the rando phantom, which you just don't get on CT because of the resolution. And I also wanted to highlight um, this new emerging technology for 3D scanning, uh, which is called neural radiance fields. 
So this reconstructs 3D scenes from photos using artificial neural networks. You, you give it a whole bunch of photos from different angles. You tell the machine learning model what angles they were taken from and what position the camera was. And then after training the machine learning model, you can generate um, reconstructions of the, the scene from angles that hadn't previously seen. And you can then convert this into a 3D model uh, of whatever the object you're trying to scan. And the big advantage to this approach is that it's uh, not subject to the same limitations of imaging transparent or reflective surfaces uh, that photogrammetry structured light scanning are. So I think we're going to see this sort of technology um, start to advance radiation oncology. One area where this technology has already been adopted for radiation oncology research is uh, reconstructing CT um, images or MRI images using neural radiance fields. So in this paper, uh, I believe it was last year, I don't have the date, sorry, um, but they, a, they were able to give it a few different slices of a CT from different angles of a patient and with just limited number of CT slices, they were able to reconstruct a 3D model of the patient. And uh, another big advantage of this model was because of the nature of the machine learning model, they were able to reconstruct it with arbitrarily high super resolution. You may have seen this technique used in other machine learning applications for um, scaling uh, images without losing resolution, but they were able to generate these very, very high resolution reconstructions of this CT volume. So I, I think a lot of these uh, advances uh, from smartphones have led to faster, higher quality and more intuitive methods of visualizing medical data and perhaps even new methods of image reconstruction, which might improve image quality on CT or cone beam CT. I don't think we can talk about 3D scanning without at least mentioning SGRT. So this is sort of almost becoming the new standard in patient position verification for radiation therapy. The earliest paper that I could find on SGRT of what we would consider SGRT was from 2000. And again, this other one from 2004, where they used a um, 3D camera system with a light projector, and they were able to reconstruct the, the shape of the patient. So these are some of the earliest examples of SGRT. Interestingly, about the same time, a company called PrimeSense was working on uh, making cameras for video games that were capable of scanning a, a, like a person in front of the camera so they could track their hand movements to interact with the video games. And they used a near-infrared light pattern and a camera system to look at the projection of the light pattern on the, the human or the object. And this is a form of structured light scanning, not dissimilar to what we use in SGRT. So this technology was subsequently licensed by Microsoft to build the first Xbox Connect camera system for video games. And this was all done in early 2000. So uh, I'm not sure if it had any influence on the development of SGRT, but it's, it's interesting that it was all done sort of in parallel about the same time SGRT was being developed. And so it's not uh, unlike the sort of camera systems you see on SGRT systems now where you have uh, camera systems and light projectors. So smartphones, I think, have led to quite huge developments, and we're starting to see that in radiation oncology, particularly for miniaturizing 3D scanning technologies, which uh, have made them uh, more cost effective. Uh, there's no radiation involved in generating these 3D scans, and they're very, very fast to reconstruct. And I think this is going to lead to new possibilities for 3D printing medical devices and bolus, for example, in radiation oncology. So uh, I wanted to see if we could sort of put all of these novel consumer technologies together and sort of achieve something interesting for, uh, from a clinical workflow point of view. So we were going to use uh, machine learning, 3D scanning, 3D modeling to try and generate an augmented SGRT technique. The question we were trying to answer was, can we get more information from SGRT than just the, the surface contour of the patient, which is very useful from a patient positioning point of view, but um, it's, it's limited. So what we wanted to see if we could do was take a 3D scan of a patient using a smartphone, so generating this 3D model, converting this to a binary mask to represent the external contour of the patient, and then training a machine learning model to sort of estimate what the internal anatomy of that scan is to try and give us some more information which might help us to um, interrupt treatments if there's a, we suspect that the motion is, is out of sight of tolerance. So we use smartphone-based 3D scanning technologies. We then use 3D modeling techniques to adjust the 3D scans and tidy them up. 
And then we use GPU accelerated machine learning techniques to train a machine learning model to predict the internal anatomy on an MRI scan based entirely just on the external of the patient. So here are some examples of the, the results from that training. So here we have, um, this is the ground truth. This is an actual uh, healthy brain uh, scan of an adult. This is the external contour from that slice. And this is the prediction of the machine learning model based on, I think it was about 60 full CT scan, uh, MRI scans of patients. And this one shows a fusion of the baseline and the predicted. And you can see in a lot of cases, they're very accurate predictions. There's obvious cases like, for example, these ventricles where it's got it wrong, um, but much of the anatomy is very similar. And um, there have been suggestions that you could use techniques like this or just uh, general homogenous water volumes from 3D scans to plan um, specialized techniques like total body irradiation and total skin electron therapy without actually needing a planning CT. This is just an example from a purely a, a 3D scan and then we put it through the machine learning model and predicted what the internal anatomy was and this is a rendering of the 3D volume. So in this study we had a, a neuroradiologist consulting with us to um, guide us and tell us uh, if there was anything we'd improve on the model, and um, I think they were generally impressed. It's obviously early days and there's limitations, but I think this was an interesting application. Uh, if you want to look at it quantitatively, we use the multi-scale structural similarity index, which is a way of measuring similarity between images, and it's been shown in the literature to correlate very well with human perceived similarities between images. Um, and if you plot the um, MSSI as a um, for all these image slices in the validation set, you can see we get an average value of about 0.85 out of a value of one, which would indicate perfect uh, similarity between the images. So it's quite impressive the amount of information you can get from just the external contour, contour of a patient. So I think this is a, an example of how modern consumer technologies uh, are augmenting medicine or could augment medicine. So in conclusion, I think developments in GPU, 3D software and scanning hardware have been driven a lot by the movie, smartphone and gaming industries. And I think because of these costs are being taken on by these um, graphics cards manufacturers, for example, it's reducing the cost to the healthcare system, but it enables access for research and uh, well, clinical tools for radiation oncology. And I think this is also leading to a rapid development and it gives us a lot of opportunities to explore these novel technologies as um, medical physicists and clinicians uh, uh, to explore these technologies as they emerge and possibly help patient treatments. So in the future, I don't think the gaming industry is going to slow down anytime soon. We're just going to see faster, more powerful GPUs um, and more general purpose GPUs for machine learning training, for example. And this will lead to possibly real-time visualization of patient treatments. One sort of example I can sort of see happening is a planner seeing an isodose line overlapping an organ at risk on a planning system. And rather than having to re-optimize, maybe just dragging the isodose and letting the optimizer do a real-time optimization and calculation. So I think that has huge advantages. Virtual and augmented reality, I think this is going to lead to new methods of contouring, visualizing plans in the treatment and planning system. And smartphones are just going to get more sensors and become in my opinion, a more comprehensive diagnostic platform, potentially not unlike the tricorder from Star Trek. So just to leave you with this, I think Mario isn't just a plumber, but he's actually an unsung hero in the fight against cancer. I think video games are helping to advance radiation therapy and will continue to help us defeat the final boss, which is cancer. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to acknowledge some of my collaborators on these projects. And if you wanna learn more about this research, feel free to uh, look at my profile on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Uh, you're on mute, Eva. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm doing the rookie mistake of Zoom, forgetting to unmuting myself. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. I felt like it was medical physics meets Star Trek. And uh, really, you know, I don't know where the future will take us so many opportunities. And I do hope that it will actually allow us to bring the cost of medical devices down and maybe make them more available 
uh, to lower and middle income countries to improve patient care there. Yep. In addition to this QR code, can I please ask you, go to your QR code with the VDB software with the free version. A couple of people oh. asked that the slide uh, passed too quickly. Yep. It could have been maybe somewhere at the beginning of your presentation. Yes, that, yep. this is the MedBlend, but do you have also the free BD, open BDB? Oh, so that's in, it's part of the package, so oh, you don't need to download right. it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So everyone take a QR code now to, because we might move uh, from here. Thank you. Michael, I have some questions in the uh, Q&A, and so I will run the discussion now if I can. Um, what do you think the tensor processing unit will be uh, for clinical use? Will it be available? Um, I mean, I don't have a huge amount of experience with how they're used. I know they're, they're specialized GPUs designed um, sort of exclusively to accelerate deep learning training. But I, I have no doubt that deep learning and machine learning are just going to become uh, a bigger part of our clinical workflow in our everyday lives. So I'm sure these tensor processing units are just going to become more advanced and just, yeah. Do you think medical physicists will be replaced by artificial intelligence? <laughs> it's a difficult question. <laughs> um, I th I, my opinion is I think our jobs are going to change. I, I don't yeah. think they'll necessarily be replaced. I think, for example, GPT has probably saved us many, many hours of writing documents and things like that, but it's freed up our time to do other things, more clinical research or clinical implementation of projects. So I, I don't think we're being replaced. I think we're just being reallocated and we're doing different tasks that we wouldn't ordinarily have time for. Do you think that using chat GPT or similar, uh, you it can be fine tuned giving chat GPT ISAPI documents? Yeah. Um, so I've just been doing some simple experiments and making custom GPT models using IEA documents and AAPM task group reports and then quizzing it on questions like how to perform small field dosimetry and what detectors you should use. And it's um, it's pretty perfect. I haven't had any issues with it. So, I mean, this is very early days, but I think it's going to be a fantastic tool to, for educational purposes and um, assisting us writing documents and things like that. Amazing. Uh Someone is asking, as a PhD student researching the intersection of radiotherapy and artificial intelligence, what advice would you offer for staying, staying ahead of the latest developments and opportunities in this rapidly evolving field? Uh, I think probably upskilling and just um, gaining knowledge, uh, not just in medical physics, but make sure you're, you're familiar with programming and have a familiarity with how machine learning and deep learning works. Um, because at least then we can make contributions to that field and we have that unique perspective from a radiation oncology medical point of view and we can guide the development of these machine learning models to assist in our in our tasks and um, I think that's probably the best advice I can give just um, yeah. upskilling. Do you think that our educational programs actually give us enough knowledge in this space you know is there enough coding and enough even the graphics training and everything. Are we starting behind and should we change our syllabi? Um, at least sort of going through my degrees, there wasn't much information on machine learning. This is something you sort of have to go out and learn for yourself. But I, I think we are starting to see in university degrees having more of a curriculum with machine learning. So I think we're slowly catching up. Um, but I think a lot of this still requires you to go out on your own and learn these things for yourself. Um, yeah. If you are using a, a software for, let's say, making the 3D structures, will it then come become classified as a medical device which will need all the approvals? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And, um, a bit of a grey area then also, yes? Yeah, can... oh, at the moment what I'm doing, I'm definitely not using it for clinical use. It's more of just an artistic and a, a better way to visualise data. Um, but I imagine if it is incorporated, things like this into treatment planning systems, it will be probably considered a medical device um, and will need to be registered in some form. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, because we want to make sure that, you know, these um, 
anything that's released is safe to be used then for uh, for patient treatments. Yeah. Uh, where, what do you see perhaps to be the next breakthrough or you touched on it a bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I, like to see? I think definitely as GPUs get faster, we're just going to be able to have these real time changes to plans. I, I imagine large language models will get incorporated. We're already seeing like machine learning optimization of plan generations. So I think the time it takes us to generate high quality plans is going to reduce. Mm -hmm. um, Does that mean that it will increase then the throughput of patients? I think so. And if you look at systems, maybe like the Varian Ethos system or MRI Linux now and the adaptive workflows, I think maybe that will exactly. become more standard practice for patients and they'll get better treatments because we'll have more time for them. We'll be able to adapt to their plans on the fly. And I think... Yeah, and can be... you then immediately reconstruct the plan from, let's like, say, Combeam CT on the fly? Yeah, yeah, and you can adapt in real time, and yeah, and like and conversion of Combeam CT into CT diagnostic quality CT scans, so you get accurate dose calculations. Or we already seen like MRI only planning, where you can convert an MRI to a synthetic CT and plan on that. So I think there's all these amazing innovations happening, and it's not going to stop anytime soon. I am checking whether uh, we have new questions. Um, I'm glad to attend these amazing presentations. I'm interested in diagnostic radiology. Uh, what is the better way to... Pr uh, is it better to do master's degree in physics and then start career in radiology? I presume I can answer that one depending on what the person wants to do. If you want to do medical physics, you have to start with undergraduate degree in physics, then postgraduate degree in medical physics where your research project can, uh, can specialize on radiology. If you want to really do diagnostic radiology as a clinician, then you have to study, uh, study medicine and specialize from there. Yeah. Um, another question, can this be used for dental radiography? Yeah, I, I've done some basic testing on just 2D planar x-rays and um, MedBlend should be able to handle it. It's still a working project and more of just a personal interest project, but I'm still working on it. And um, if you do want to test it for this and you find any problems, please just let me know um, and I'll work on it. Okay. Uh, in regards to MRIs that you uh, mentioned, we know that, the, of course, we were not able to plan on MRIs because of the MRI grayscale does not correspond to the electron density. Uh, so you can't really calculate the dose deposition plus the distortion, uh, geometrical distortion, which is larger further away you are from the central axis. So when you are then doing this conversion to CT and then um, calculate the dose distribution on these reconstructed uh, CT images, has anyone looked at the accuracy, how accurate this is? Yeah, I, I mean, I can't think of any papers specifically, but I know they are out there and um, uh, I, I suspect they're not going to be as accurate as a direct CT, but um, they can still give you very accurate approximations of a CT, which I think would probably be better than a cone beam CT replan. Um, which is very noisy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think there are huge benefits, and I think it would be almost, um, I think it's going to become the standard maybe for MRI planning where you can't just adapt a plan by getting a CT of the patient replanning. You have to use the data you have available. So that would be the MRI. So. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure this technology is going to improve and the accuracy will improve, but um, it, it's a machine learning model. It's, it's estimating based on it, an, a knowledge-based approach. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not without its disadvantages, but I think it's got huge potential for gains as well. How do we physicists go around implementation, validation and quality assurance of these new tools? Yeah, it does make it more difficult because it's more of a black box than anything else. Um, at least uh, in our center, I mean, we're using deep learning segmentation now. We don't trust it implicitly. We don't take its predictions as the ground truth. We use it as a tool to aid us 
and speed up our workflow, but we always check what it's giving us. And I think you have to do that with any machine learning application. Just don't trust the, what it gives you blindly. Um, yeah, you have no idea what the quality of the data was it was trained on, and it's it may see an unusual case, not know what to do with it, and give you weird results. So you always have to validate what it on the fly. Compare it. What do you validate it against? I guess in the case of segmentation, it's going to be up to the oncologist and their specific contouring Check styles to decide. But it gives you a, a a starting point, an average which you can then adapt, and might save you eighty percent of the time that you would have spent contouring and. The same way with treatment planning based on machine learning algorithms, it's going to give you probably a good starting point and then yeah. you spend a little bit of time tweaking it based on your own personal preference. So uh, I don't know what it will be like in the future, but I think for now we just use it as a tool to assist but never replace. Yeah. And uh, if someone wants to sort of st start learning machine learning and AI, do you recommend a textbook or uh, do you uh, have a read people? Should yeah, go there was a great textbook I learned. I mean, there's lots of online courses you can take and they've got various levels of difficulty and <laughs> depends how much you want to go. Um, uh, I've got to remember the name of the book. I think it was um, Introduction to Machine Learning with Keras. Uh, there are lots mm -hmm. of different softwares you can use to train machine learning models, but I found Keras, which sits, it's like a, uh, a layer that sits on top of TensorFlow or PyTorch, uh, which are more sophisticated machine learning model frameworks, but I find that very intuitive and a much easier starting point. Um, but just starting from very simple models, like even just simple linear regression with machine learning approaches, which is overkill, but it teaches the, 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 the process and then working to support vector machines and then uh, just simple neural networks and then convolutional neural networks. So you really just have to start small and work your way up until you're comfortable. I'm by no means an expert. I'm still learning myself, but uh, I guess if you have an interest in the field, it drives you to sort of learn how to do these things. Michael, fantastic. Can I please ask you to stop sharing your screen? Yep. Okay, wonderful. And I will share my screen. Uh, so before I say thank you to our speaker, I would like to thank all the participants for their participation in today's webinar. And I would like to also bring your attention to the upcoming webinar that will be held on the 22nd of February, where we will have the presenters from Laplace and Sun Nuclear. Uh, talking about their products and this will be actually a good follow-up because LEP will be talking about the service-guided radiation therapy and Sun Nuclear will be talking uh, about their products for improvement of patient safety. I will stop sharing now. Michael, Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, for spending time with us. It was really, really quite amazing. I now feel so much behind. <laughs> and uh, um, we are really going through the fourth industrial generation in this time. And uh, it can be on one hand a bit scary, but on the other hand, it's opening up so many more opportunities. So fingers crossed that it will actually make the patient treatment and diagnosis cheaper and more readily available. Uh, you know, I'm working with, uh, for example, smartphones in applications for point of care ultrasounds, where people in remote and rural areas or developing countries, they can do have small portable machines and immediately transport their images on smartphone to a clinician somewhere else. So that way even patients in very remote areas can immediately get their images assessed. So this is immediately transferring, uh, transforming uh, the healthcare that we can provide. Michael, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And I will see you next month. All the very best, everyone. Thank you.